Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel Fast. I'm the head of the Department of Sociology here at Trinity College Dublin. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this event in the Trinity UCD Sociology Public Lecture Series. The series was founded by us in 2013, in January 2013, to bring internationally acclaimed speakers to our campus to discuss contemporary sociological issues. The goals are to promote informed and nonpartisan debate, to offer new ideas on cutting edge sociological issues, and to provide a platform to deepen our research and teaching synergies between the two universities. The keynote tonight is being filmed by Mark Linane, and you can see tonight's and the recordings of all the 10 previous keynotes that have taken place to date on the college's YouTube playlist if you go to TCD UCD Sociology Public Lecture Series. Two housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, could you in please ensure that your mobile phones are in silent mode or totally switched off? And secondly, just locate the emergency exits uh, that are behind you on each side as you came in, basically. Before I give the floor to my co-organizer, Dr. Diane Payne, who is the head of the School of Sociology at University College Dublin, to introduce our distinguished guest, Professor Nan Lin, let me flag up that this lecture series continues in the autumn and that you will receive notifications in due course of uh, the events that are upcoming in Michaelmas term. Professor Lin will speak for about three quarters of an hour to an hour, and that's followed by a 30-minute question and answer session in which all of you have a chance, as we always do, uh, to engage with our keynote speaker. But now please welcome my co-host Diane Payne from UCD. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, so it's my great pleasure to um, welcome Professor Nan Lin to Dublin and to the TCD-UCD joint lecture series for 2015. Um, I'm just going to give you a very brief um, overview of his biography and then really leave the floor to Nan Lin to give his presentation. Just to give you some background, uh, Nan Lin was um, uh, trained at the Tang Chi University for his undergraduate degree and then from there went to Syracuse University for an MA and Michigan State University as his alma mater for his doctoral degree, which was awarded in 1966. Um, he joined the University of Albany in SUNY in 1971 and was made full professor in 1976. And from there, um, he developed um, a number of um, collaborations with Chinese universities, in particular initially starting an exchange program between Albany and Nankai University. Uh, in 1990, he was appointed um, sociology professor at Duke University. Um, as um, professor of sociology there, he took on several different roles, um, including director of the Asian Pacific Studies Institute, and was also appointed vice president of the American Sociological Association. He's been awarded um, numerous different um, um, accreditations, honorary doctorates, honorary professorships and so forth, and a, a, num a number of, amongst those are the Peking University and oh. University of Groningen. Uh, Lin's research lies in social networks, social support and social capital. He has contributed to theory, devised measurements and conducted empirical research in each of these areas. In particular, Nan Lin has written about social networks since the early 1980s. Lin has contributed to um, the economically oriented branch of literature on social capital, primarily in the, st in the strands developed by Mark Granovetter and James Coleman, where his primary focus throughout his career, I think, is a, a combination and an ambition to collaborate or to build collaboration between theoretical development and empirical testing. In particular, his definition of social capital as access to resources through network ties is one of the most widely accepted conceptualizations of the term. He has applied the theory and measurements, both he has applied theory and measurements, both quantitative and qualitative, to the study of social stratification, mobility, stress, and coping, individual organization, and community well-being. Lane has authored or edited many different books, 40 book chapters, and numerous journal articles. Amongst the international peer review journals, he has published in the American Journal of Sociology, Social Networks, American Sociological Review, to name but a few. Amongst his various books has included the key text, Social Capital, A Theory of Social Structure and Action, 
and many different and influential writers in the field of social network analysis have praised this work as the definitive work on the subject of social capital. So with this ringing endorsement, it gives me great pleasure to ask Professor Lynn to talk to us this evening on the topic, social networks and economic analysis, an embedded economy perspective. Uh, thank you, Professor Haas, Haas and Professor Payne, and uh, uh, dear colleagues and students. <clears throat> uh, this is my first trip to Ireland, uh, as well as for my wife here. And uh, so we've been here one, one day, but apparently that we've experienced all the four seasons in one day. <clears throat> uh, it's, a, it's a really great pleasure. Uh, for us to be here and uh, to have the opportunity uh, to do some exchange with you about uh, my current work. This is one of my current projects. And uh, so most of you, or those of you who know me, probably know me uh, by my work on uh, specifically the social capital. And I'll touch on it a little bit uh, once in a while, but uh, this is one area that I'm trying to sort of expand my own research and, uh, and uh, to take a look at the, what sociology and the, and the economy interact. And so it's a very hot topic, of course, and uh, I'll try to make a slight contribution in this area. So, uh, <laughs> so anyhow, uh, what I wanted to do is to address three issues. The first issue is what is the badness? And uh, since Mark Brander sort of uh, 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 raised the issue in 1985, even though Polanyi uh, had deal with the issue a long time ago, and it has become a very major focus, not only in sociology, but in economics and other social science disciplines. And so what I want to discuss today is what is really embedded. And uh, so are there differences, uh, per se, between uh, social embedding economic or in economic embedding. All right. And uh, it's, a, it's a very important issue and we need to clarify it and differentiate between the two. Uh, the second issue I wanted to talk about is whether social networks are institutional in nature or can they be a constructive? Again, there's a very interesting issue. Uh, social networks being institutional in the sense that it would belong to a, a, a social group ethnic, religious, uh, and, and so forth, and therefore that we form networks from that basis. So this is what I call so-called the so institutional or cultural basis of social networks. And sometimes we simply use the term structure in general, so that it, this is sort of a structurally based social networks. On the other hand, the interesting phenomenon is that the, within in fact the social networks can be constructed. And so rather than a, a sort of normative, routinized, institutionalized way of, uh, of finding our friends and uh, construct the, or, or connecting with others, what in fact we can construct a, a, a new social ties and, uh, and relationships. And what does that do to our theory? Right? So the final issue, then, of course, is that once I try to address these first two issues, is to look at the possible theoretical or empirical significance if we can differentiate these terminologies or concepts in our research. Uh, when I talk about economy and society, I'm really talking about really sociological work on this topic. And uh, so I sort of uh, differentiate three phases of, uh, of uh, the analysis between sociology, society and the economy. Phase one is, is most of what the sociologists did uh, before, say, 1970s or eight, even early 80s. All right? And this is the era where sociologists claim that the social norms, the values, and so forth affect economic activities and relationships. Uh, so this is where the most of what they call the institutional uh, analysis comes in. 
So we say, well, okay, you cannot do econo economic analysis as, uh, unless you know the culture, the normative background of the community where you engage in the research. So this is presumably the contribution of uh, sociology or society to sociology, uh, to economy. And this is what I call economic sociology 1.0. And we can sort of uh, express uh, this analytical model uh, representing sociology, uh, economic sociology 1.0, namely that you form, look at a particular type of economic activity uh, or organization, and then you analyze how social norms and values affect the economic activities in terms of this outcome. So that uh, social, social uh, contributions comes in in between ad identified economic activity and certain outcomes. And of course, this model has been criticized as being overly socialized. Uh, in other words, that uh, you talk about norms and values are very general for group community characteristics. And so that you do not pay enough attention to individual actors. Right? So, and also that uh, some economists claim that this would only be useful if we analyze pre-industrial societies where there were no uh, rationalized uh, laws, legitimate uh, procedures and so forth. Therefore, that, that the social norms, religion, ethnicity and so forth affect the economic uh, uh, activities and their outcomes. <clears throat> so the correction then came in, in terms of Mark Granager's work and the mo most important a reference is his 1985 article uh, which uh, used the term embeddedness, which in fact he borrowed from Polanyi. It means that the uh, economic activities are always associated or affected by non-economic non -economic social relations or, uh, or ties. Uh, so in other words, introducing social uh, aspects back into the economic uh, behavior, but uh, by focusing on social relations <coughs> rather than norms and values. And the argument was that the social relations deal with interactions. Therefore, you could identify the actors in the relationships among actors. So it's more a micro than the overly socialized approach uh, that uh, earlier sociologists had contributed to this topic. And uh, so that's the first important contribution, sorry, in sort of reintroducing the actors, or either call it the micro or meso uh, uh, emphasis rather than a macro emphasis. The second contribution, which uh, 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 it's in, sort of implicit in the article, is that this kind of things happen even today. It's not just for pre-industrial societies, but also for modern societies as well. Right? So kind of gave a lot of uh, examples of modern day uh, European and American uh, research and demonstrated fact, social relations do make a difference in terms of uh, the impact of uh, economic behavior and its outcome. <clears throat> so this is a, becomes a very major a, a paradigm and that is still very prevalent <coughs> even today. Right? That uh, this article uh, is among the most cited uh, in, in among social science uh, publications, and so, and it's I would still call it the prevailing paradigm. So this uh, a, a, a paradigm can be expressed in this kind of model. So you have suddenly again, identify certain economic activity, say it's an economic organization or trade or whatever, and then you look at the contributions, social relations or social networks contribute to this process. And so again, sort of the, the social, see if I can, yeah. So the, the social relations and social networks sort of interact with the economic activities. So it's a, again, 
it's still an interaction between economic and non-economic uh, factors. But now the, economic, the social factors are analyzed in terms of relationships rather than norms and the values. And if we look at the literature, and uh, many of you probably are familiar with the so-called the economic sociology literature, and this is the, the way we approach it. All right, that first, you identify economic activity, being in labor market or uh, organizational operations and uh, productions and, uh, and the trade and so forth. And then uh, you find out who are involved in those activities. So these actors are identified. And then you study whether, in fact, the actors have sort of non-formalized relationships, or right? so it's informal relationships, social ties and relationships. And then try to demonstrate, in fact, such ties and relationships makes a difference. Sort of it distorted the, the, the projection of the strict, uh, atomized the economic behavior uh, ought to predict. All right, so this, in this sense, that this is the contribution of the economic sociology, and I call it economic sociology, you mentioned 2.0. So this is the way we, 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 we do it at work. And so the actors identified in such analysis, including, for example, sellers, buyers, and uh, in, the labor, in the labor market, we we'll look at uh, uh, job seekers and helpers, which I also have contributed to. Uh, agents, traders, and so forth. Okay, they, so you identify these actors. And then you then demonstrate that, in fact, the relationships among them would create some kind of effect on the economic uh, activities or outcome. So again, we can sort of graphically present this sort of conceptualization of the, this uh, embeddedness, namely, that you see the economic the economic activity presumably is the frame. All right, whatever it's a labor market, it's a trade relationship, and so forth. Then within it, then you identify the relationships and so forth. And then document how these relationships affect the economic activity. <clears throat> So some of the features are very interesting. First is that for most of the researchers, the identifying the economic activity as the frame is the first thing to do. And you identify economic organization or a particular market and so forth. Then you analyze the actors engaged in these activities within the framework. And then you, then you say, OK, to their action, interaction to make a difference in terms of, of, of the economic activities and its effect. So the greater, of course, the intention, uh, first of all, is to engage the economists, to remind the economists that they have to pay attention to so-called non-economic activities, especially social relations and networks. And so in that, uh, in that sense, uh, it's, the embeddedness uh, makes a, a lot of sense. But another important a contribution he makes is, in fact, he mentioned, again, Polanyi's original intention, namely that you have to look at the non-economic relations. Now, Grenville did mention that, but most researchers, unfortunately, most of them are in business schools, <laughs> even though they're sociologists, and so they always follow this model, namely that they identify economic activity and then analyze the actors and their interactions within it and then identify their, their uh, effects uh, on the economic activities. So I think that uh, there is some, I wouldn't say total distortion of Mark Brandovich's in uh, plan, uh, the general statement, but as a result, because I think both the Brandovich's emphasis on engaging the economists, and two, is that the most of the sociologists engaged in economic sociology, in fact, they find themselves embedded, in fact, in the economic uh, or business schools environments so that it's very natural and easy for them to find the market, the trade, and so forth, organization, and then do these analysis. As a result, this becomes the uh, prevailing model. 
is the question to me, I think, is do economic activities always involve social relations? Or another way to mention, is it possible for social relations to proceed or proceed or engulf economic activities? Right? Now, this is very important. One, on the one hand, I want to re-engage the economic sociology number one, namely that the, whether institutionalized networks and relationships have effect on economic activities or, or not. Because economic activity, sociology, too, seem to sort of set aside economic, economic sociology number uh, one. So uh, I call this, so I, the first economics in, embedding the, the social relations, I call it economically embeddedness. All right, so you sort of embedded social relations in the, the economy. But the second possibility, of course, is that in fact, social embeddedness, that is you have some kind of social framework, social relations, social ties, and then you social, economic activities uh, are engaged or in it. But the social relations and social networks come first, theoretical sense and also in the uh, sequence of occurrences. I think this is important because if you look at the social, social embeddedness, then what happens is that the social actors are the primary identification or identity of those actors. They engage in economic activities, right? But their basic important identity is a part of social unit or social structure. As, as a, you compare to the prevailing economic sociology too, where in fact you immediately identify this person as a trader, seller, buyer, or job seeker, and so forth. So it sort of identified them as economic actor, actors as such. And they pretty much have sort of set aside their other social relationships or, or uh, uh, characteristics. So this is the, something that is very important to me, all right, theoretically. And also we need to, to think of possibilities. This kind of socially embeddedness work uh, exists not only in historical sense, but also in contemporary sense. Historically, that of course, it's a, uh, this is again, uh, this is that. So, um, so this is the, in fact, the framework we ought to think about. That is, you first have the networks, right? And then the actors within this network engage in economic activities, right? So they're both, in a sense, both the economic sociology two, and now I'm talking about economic sociology three, involve economic activity and social relations. But the framing is very different, right? Economic sociology two, you identify the economy and then social relations inside. Whereas economic so sociology three is you identify social networks and ties and then find how these actors engage in economic activities. All right. So what are the premises of this understanding? Well, the first of all, of course, is that the social relations networks precede economic activities, which we actually we understand. I mean, you know, if you look at the economic sociology one, even though they don't talk about relations and networks, but they certainly argue society or social elements precede economic activities, right? ethnic groups, religious groups, etc. And then these groups, the members, engaged in economic activities. So, so the actors of social entity engage in economic activities. But two, importantly, these social relations networks, in fact, are established and offer independent economic social activities. It's important for us, us to, to determine that, in fact, these, the networks and social ties exist independent of the economic activities. So in other words, economic acti activities are simply part of their performance, their actions. Right? But they, in the non-economic terms, they still engage one another and interact. 
But if they do engage economic activities, then social relationships take priority. It's not that they don't engage in relationships with others from an outside group, right? but they would try to sort of give priority, primacy to other members or other actors within the sort of, the sort of network and so forth. Well, the question is that, first of course, you, we have to, 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 to demonstrate that, in fact, the social relations or social networks are, uh, make, uh, make sense. Why do people engage in social networks? Well, it turns out, of course, there are things that are relevant for economic activities. First of all, of course, is that we want better information in networks because in a non-perfect, in perfect now market situation, you rely on information from interpersonal sources. Right? So we all know this. As it turns out, of course, the economists would say, well, there are cases theoretically that are the perfect markets. You don't need to worry about all the social issues. But we have not found one as yet. All right, so far. All the markets are in perfect. So so it, 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 there's a very valid reason to look at them. The, the imperfect market, where how the information is transmitted, diffused, the flow uh, across uh, interpersonal relationships. The second important thing is that the social relations, social work, uh, work networks, uh, promote uh, sentiment and trust. As it turns out, the very interesting uh, is that the, the sentiment or trust is in, can be in contrast with instrumentation. Yeah, so I usually use the term expressive action versus instrumental action. Right? So if I'm pushed to give really bare bone definition or differentiation between two, and I would say sentiment and trust is when relationships are both the means and the end. Right? So engage in a relationship and uh, we really have we don't need to have any intention for any other outcome except that they will engage in each other, providing solidarity, comprehension, co 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 cohesion, support, and so forth. Whereas the instrumentation or instrumental action is that the means is different from the ends. Right? So you engage in relationships, but you are motivated to, to accomplish something else. You want a good job, you want to you know, do something else with these relationships. Uh, so it promotes competition, marketplace, and mobility in society. So that the social networks can do both. Uh, can do both. And the another element, very interesting, is that uh, it allows us to engage in asymmetric exchanges and repeated exchanges. So that if I do you a favor, I don't immediately ask you, what can you do for me? That's a very bad way. Uh, maintain certain relations or construction. Rather, there is some kind of implicit, non-contractual understanding that I'm doing a favor, all right, but you have to pay me back somehow. All right? How is very interesting. All right? But anyhow, so there is a result. Either you do a favor to me in the future, or if you don't do me a favor, what do you do? You promote my reputation. So you spread the word around, then Nanli is a good guy. All right? You don't tell people Nanli is doing your thumb down in favor, but you simply say he's a good guy. So it gives me what? Social credit. It's not only just between the two individuals, but it's a generalized reputation. So that in the network and beyond, then I gain the social credit. Social credit is fantastic. All right? So we give awards, you know? give Oscar awards, Nobel Prize awards. The monetary thing is really relatively really little, but uh, you know, we have testimonies, ceremonies, right? And these things are, in a sense, a generalized uh, way of promoting reputation. But the reputation starts in the transmission of the recognition in networks. Very important. And also, of course, it acts as a sections, right? So if, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, if I uh, uh, ask you for some money and then I run away, then you could say, this is a bad guy. Right? So that the word gets around that other people will not want to engage in interactions with them. Right? So it's a, again, 
you don't need a contract uh, to do that. And so it's a very powerful. So networks have many reasons uh, to, 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 be, to be around. And the interesting thing, of course, is that the social networks and social relations allow us to engage in both expressive and the instrumental exchanges. Now, I mentioned this, this relationship itself is a reward, all right? Because you, you get either uh, payoff uh, in the future or you gain reputation, recognition, and so forth. But also that uh, it is possible to use social relations to engage in, uh, in, in economic uh, instrumental exchanges, all right? So I give you something and presumably you can uh, back. So it is a, this is a simple a, a, a definition of a trade and so that it can be turned in, uh, as economic activity and such. Right? The interesting thing is that social relations engage social actors, but they can also become economic actors whenever it is appropriate. Right? So that the role, they can take multiple roles, but the primary role is the social role, identification within the network, within the group, etc. Right? And then you, of course, can also engage in economic activity. All right, as I mentioned, that there, there, there are many ways of look at the, uh, the, the pre-existing social networks and the independent of uh, economic activities. And so I mentioned some of the uh, typical uh, groups that uh, we study in sociology and many others as well. Right? So we identify the actors, and they are, men, they are members of a group, ethnic group, family group, religious groups, but they have all multiple roles. So in addition to being a Christian or Protestant, the person could also be something else, many of them. But when it comes to the basic identity, <coughs> the social networks or the cultural institutions become critical. So uh, I call this the institutionalized networks, uh, based on these so basic sort of fundamental social characteristics. And the social actors first they, they want to promote and maintain social relations. All right. So the sort of the ethnic groups, the religious group can, can 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 persist and over time and so forth. So they engage in a lot of the activities just to promote this group. All right. So there's a lot of interesting studies done in, in China. And I talk about this a little bit about guanxi. Right. Promoting guanxi or uh, deep social relations in China, you have to invite each other to to dinner once in a while, and you have to give gifts to one another, and so forth. There are many rituals that you have to perform. Right? And it's, it's for no other purpose than to, to sort of maintain the school identity and keep it going. And I'm sure that in every group you will find such uh, activities. But they also engage in, in economic activities, so they utilize the institutionalized networks to perform a, uh, 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 economic activities. So historically, of course, we know this, this is true. Right? A, a very famous uh, study by, uh, by a uh, economist, a graph, and, uh, and looking at the Jewish uh, Maghrib uh, traders in North Africa and then in, in the Mediterranean area and so forth in the uh, uh, 11th century. And the, these Jewish uh, traders, they, in fact, they're all uh, identify uh, as members of this group, and they become traders whenever uh, necessary. They did not need any contracts, and their verbal agreements were due, and they each perform multiple roles. Uh, they can be supplier, buyer, they can be broker, and so forth. So whatever is necessary, they will perform for each other, and they make a very thriving economic business. In the Primarily a Muslim world. Uh, so uh, we became famous because of this uh, and both the subsequent analysis. And of course, it's been criticized right, uh, by uh, the other economists 
and uh, more recently by Edwards and uh, uh, their argument. So they wait a minute, this, this uh, sort of a, a ethnic identity relationships uh, exist in, in other parts uh, of, uh, of Europe at least and uh, during about the same time. So they mentioned the Italian traders Germanic networks, the Dutch networks, and I'm sure that, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the literature on Ireland, but I'm sure that the Irish uh, groups uh, uh, engaged in, in uh, trading and so forth, and using their kinship, marriage, patronage, and these other kinds of ties. Right? So uh, this, is, but it's turned out this kind of relationships uh, extended beyond what the group called, it's a particular, ethnic Jewish group uh, in that particular time, and he argued that uh, you know, it's probably uh, much weakened uh, since the Industrial Revolution and so forth. But we found out, of course, which is not true, even today, we find these groups operate in such manner very well. And the very powerful evidence, of course, is the Chinese uh, ethnic group uh, networks uh, around the world. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting work that demonstrate that the, the Chinese using their cultural, uh, ethnic, and uh, kinship ties to maintain uh, all kinds of social relationships beyond China. Uh, so you'll find, find them in, uh, doing the same thing in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in Singapore, in the United States, uh, Canada. And uh, this morning we found them even in the little Chinatown in Dublin. And so that uh, so they, they kept using their uh, sort of the network ties and to engage others in economic activities, uh, but maintaining really a very strong identification as their role and the membership in this uh, particular group. So it, it is interesting in the sense that the Guanxi precedes economic activities. So not all the Guanxi, in fact, uh, uh, deal with the economic activity, right? but they can be triggered and uh, activated when there's economic activities. Uh, the, I don't have time today uh, to talk about, even today I'm talking about you know, how the, the so-called the second generation uh, of the, uh, the communist leaders, how they engaged in both political and economic activities and how they transfer the capital uh, from the political uh, uh, regime to the economic regime, almost seamless. And you cannot even find, see the Western way of analyzing the relationship, you look at the boards of directors and so on, you cannot find it <laughs> in, the, in the, just strictly looking at the boards of uh, directors because they are all the different places in different organizations. Some very interesting a phenomenon that you, you identify. I don't know how, how many of you follow the story about this huge, huge uh, uh, Chinese private entity called Anbang. Right? Anbang used to be only a small uh, insurance company, but now they just bought the Astor Hotel in New York, and uh, they're just all over the place. Right? And this, this is, who is behind uh, this Anbang group? And you look at them and you say, well, the, the, the chairman of the board is a, a 40 year old something, nobody. Uh, so, how, how, how could we hold this together and find all this capital uh, to engage in such uh, huge investment and so forth? And then you dig deeper and say, ah, so and so is related to this, and he was the son in law of Deng Xiaoping. <laughs> or, or that uh, someone else was the son of Chen Yi, Chen Yi, of course, the first generation revolutionaries. And, uh, so it, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon that they, they, they just sort of transfer resources or I, what I call you know, using a fantastic use of social capital in, in, in engaging. Now, of course, they all want to be rich. Before it was political, right? They wanted to be the, the highest targets in the political system. But now they, uh, they, they say, okay, money is good. Right? So they start moving in this direction. But you can see they can move back and forth. Many of them move back to the political regime. Okay, that's beyond this paper. But I wanted to, to show you that, in fact, it's very good. And it works, all right, at least for 
for the for, for this uh, this ethnic group. Right? So the summary is that they we're talking about embedding economic activities in institutionalized networks. Interesting, all right? So the existing institutional networks precede economic activities. And the economic activities are embedded in social networks. Does not mean that the social actors are, uh, behave as economic. However, the economic relations extend beyond the institutional network. So they go beyond. Uh, they know that in order to, to, to make money, they have to engage other, other uh, uh, members, other actors who are not members of this. So that, all right, the, the, the foreign uh, uh, companies and so forth, uh, how do they go into China to do business? It's very hard because they don't have the country. So the Chinese sort of create a pseudo networks for them. Then they says, okay, you join us, right? So we have a joint venture. The joint venture usually, of course, is led by the Chinese actors who are usually communist members and the General Motors and the and the Volvo and so, so all get in there and they make money, all right? But as part of this sort of, sort of, I won't want to call it marginal parochial members, but it's really not the core of the network that is doing this economic activity. All right, the last topic uh, is, all right, we talk about these existing social groups, right? Ethnic groups and political uh, cadres and religious groups. But can we construct such a network? This topic is very important to us because we don't want the argument to be just a structure. Right? It's a structurally institutionally based argument. That we've done for 40, 50 years. Uh, we don't need to rehash it. We simply bring it back to our attention. But the important thing is that is it possible to construct social networks and then use them for economic activities. Aha! Uh -huh. The cyber space comes to the rescue. Right? And uh, so, of course, in the last 20 years, and suddenly we have this new thing, and it's called cyberspace. And, uh, the, and uh, what I call the emergence of uh, cyber networks. Cyber networks is defined as social networks in cyberspace. Do you know who created this term? I did. <laughs> you checked my book, 2001, the last chapter. All right? And this was 2001, this before all these big things had come out. I said, OK, let's look at the cyber networks and see how they, they influence. And so you, the focus is, is not on social media, which is the popular term, but rather networks in cyberspace. All right, so I call it cyber networks. The interesting thing is that the cyber networks, there are cyber network sites, but not necessarily all social media as a cyber network sites. They focus on networks. They promote networks. The networks become the plat platform for economic activity. Can you think of one site? Facebook. <laughs> but in fact, it started by AOL. Right? AOL was the first uh, uh, site that they promoted this using the forums and chat rooms and so forth. And then huge, huge uh, 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 membership and uh, made a lot of money. In fact, the AOL got so big, they bought Time Warners. And I don't know whether you really remember that, but it, eventually it collapsed. The reason, many reasons quite collapsed. One is that you rely on telephone. Uh, so when, when people moved on, the cables and others of so forth. And, um, and two is they shifted their attention from the promotion of the social networks to economic advantage, advertisement, and so forth. And so the networks really declined very quickly. Right? And so these are the reasons why, why, uh, why they failed. But it was the first one that it, it, the, it, uh, the, uh, it was created just for to promote social networks. The second very important, and probably many of you don't know, is MySpace. MySpace, in fact, should have been Facebook. <laughs> and it was, again, the promotion of a, uh, a, 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 a uh, networks, and, and people allowed to, were allowed to create their own page and to bring friends and so forth. But again, it, it, uh, it, uh, it failed and, uh, because, first of all, Facebook come, came along 
And secondly, because it made some mistakes, it allowed an anonymous address. See, the Facebook was smart. You presume as your real name. The real name carries a very important credit, right? Because if you have fake names, then anything can happen. I mean, people abused the system, right? And pretty soon it was, uh, and nobody wanted to do it because it was just very bad, right? But now if somebody is trying to revise it, I think it's too late. Now, the mature cyber network site is Facebook. Right? If you probably know the history of this, it started as a, a simply a, a college a student directory, and uh, then find relationships and so forth at uh, Harvard. And then you brought in all the colleges and so forth and so forth. So even today, most people join Facebook not because they want to be economic actors. In fact, they have nothing to do with economics, right? They want to find their friends, they want to be liked, etc., etc. So it's all development of social relations and social types. And Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg knew precisely this. I'm not sure he still knows that today. <laughs> yeah. So he asked for real names, real identities, and he always tried to facilitate better networks. Right? And so it grew. I think it, now it's, uh, it's close to 2 billion users uh, in the world. And now, of course, Zuckerberg wants to make money. So the organization itself is economic in nature. So we have to differentiate. Right? Even for economic organization, there are times, in fact, you should push the economy side, focus on social relations. In fact, I argue, for good cyber networks, the first requirement is that you have to have a lot of engaging social actors who are not engaged in economic activities. They're, the, they're not to, there to buy things or sell things, but rather they are to try to find social ties and relationships. All right, they may be become economic actors because you feel clever enough to give them a place and hide your uh, advertisements well enough. They say, ah, I may be interested in this, this, this car or that cosmetic, All right? So they, they allow a, a, a economic entities to make a lot of money. Finally, of course, you know that uh, Facebook is making a lot of money. Right? So the eco the organization, I mean, for Facebook itself, is economical. It serves as a broker, so it's a lot of economic returns to so, so some sponsors. But I argue their life depends on all right, the maintenance and persistence of social relations. If they tell everybody you have to buy things or sell things or do other economic things, I think most people will, will leave. Right? So I hope that they follow this, and that's so far, so far. Uh, so the promotion of networks is a high priority. So this proves, in a sense, that social networks can be constructed without, in fact, any institutions. You may take advantage of these institutions because people bring their friends along. The mother alone, all right, some of them, all right. And, uh, but, but you have to, in a sense, allow all right, the social network to evolve over time. You create both what we call the strong and the weak ties. All right. So a, a very rich network has all kinds of interesting characteristics and all kinds of resources, which I will uh, conclude very shortly. But uh, as a result, you can see the other sides are moving they realize that uh, their shortcomings are the lack of social networks. All right, so they are, they are trying to, to sort of converge on the cyber networks. Some of them have better luck than others. Right? And uh, so interesting enough that uh, uh, they are all more in direct directions. Again, I don't have time. There are many interesting uh, phenomena that are social only. For example, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not economic. Right? But it thrives. It's not even commercial. All right. All right. So this is what I call the economic sociality street, namely social networks embedding economy. No social. What's the big deal? We all know these elements and so forth. The big deal 
is that conceptually we face certain networks preceding and dictating economic activities. And therefore, the creation and maintenance of certain networks and social capital should be front and center in theory and design for, for us, for researchers. So you can see, again, we are looking at network design as out there, as the framing. Then you design, presumably, economics to make money. All right? But the first course focus is always here. All right, so now we can sort of integrate the three. All right, we say, oh, okay, all three are still important. Economic, sociology one is that, of course, institutions are, are important. Two is uh, economic, sociology two is important because you still need to analyze the relationships within um, economic activities. But now we're saying economic, sociology three, in fact, is equally and perhaps gaining its significance in the future because networks become the friend and also takes on the preceding uh, uh, priority in our interests. Anyhow, so this is the, so there are some implications for theory development and research designs. I'm running short of time. And so the last thing I want to mention, of course, there's a dark side, <laughs> social embeddedness. One is that uh, you always create inside and outsiders. Right. And uh, so the dead networks are great because it promotes maintenance and solidarity and cohesion, but it creates a problem of differentiation between insiders and outsiders. There's tremendous consequences. And it does bias and distort the market. I mean, without a doubt, right? those who have the, the inside track uh, make more money, or even in a competitive market. And the third thing we should uh, uh, to alert ourselves to is that it reproduces, accelerates inequality. Right? Those are in, in the right networks and so forth. We'll keep doing this. Of course, we know that you know, from Bourdieu's times. But it's interesting to see how it's been uh, 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 amplified in contemporary society. Right. OK. Uh, so how do we overcome? There are things we should do. Right? We can we somehow keep the networks open and, uh, uh, and uh, diversify uh, the, the, the participants in the networks. And there, there are other, of course, legal and the moral means to do it. But uh, again, this I can simply mention. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I'm Gianluca Michone from the UCD uh, School of Business, but I'm a sociologist by background, so I had to say something. <laughs> uh, one question, besides the sake of the argument, I don't see why you need to polarize too much uh, the economics preceding the social versus the opposite. Because let's say that I want to start a grocery, a grocery store. I may start with friends, whatever else. But at some point, to keep the grocery store running, I'm fine having just economic relations, maintaining, uh, I mean, paying back for the bills and whatever I buy. So I see the point of making the argument contrasting the two. But in uh, a real life situation, the two can work depending on specific cases, I guess. And the second question is about social networks, the cyber social networks. Uh, I see the point, but for what I could see, at least for now, I cannot say anything about the future, uh, they tend to replicate a lot existing networks, existing institutions, existing uh, networks of friends, mm -hmm. uh, ethnic networks, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So they don't seem to construct relations beyond uh, what is already in place. Yeah. 
Good point. Thank you. Uh, it, the, the first point is well taken. Uh, so you, 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 if you look at, uh, say, the, uh, the shoppers, the supermarket, and there are two ways you can do it. You can station at the supermarket and uh, interview those who come to, to buy, uh, and then you see whether, in fact, they, whether they're being influenced by early buyers or other friends that come to the supermarket. Or, you could look at a group, a community neighborhood, okay, and see who goes to certain groceries and so forth. Uh, my argument is that it makes a difference, right? Because the framing is different. Because the first one is what I call economic society two. So you go to a supermarket, you identify them as economic actors already, right? because they come to the supermarket, and therefore, that your attention is to really the, the engagement of the economic activities. Right? And uh, whereas the second approach, I argue, if you're interested in, <laughs> of course, bias in society. Right? So you want to see why certain neighborhoods right, they tend to, to, uh, to have good supermarkets, and others don't even have a Starbucks, for example, or McDonald's. Okay? And so my so that the, these are not, I would say, necessarily competing. Okay? It's simply that allow us to remind ourselves that when, okay, if I turn it around, what are the consequences of my research? So that's my <laughs> the second point is that absolutely again, you're right, namely that uh, we engage others always sort of the, we're, you know, uh, we're part of the, uh, the normative <laughs> structure, all right? So we, we know some kinds of things we prefer and, and the other people we prefer. So even on Facebook, it's quite clear that we're reproducing the relationships in non-online uh, situations. However, one interesting finding is indeed we find people are engaged more with text than offline. In other words, in offline, it's very difficult or people are very reluctant you know, to go beyond the sudden length in terms of their relationships. Right? There's a tremendous cost involved if you go way with this. But Facebook really reduced that transaction cost, transaction in terms of relational cost. <laughs> And so that uh, you do engage, you don't, you don't, you don't ever give up your so strong ties. You reproduce the strong ties in, in, for example, Facebook. But you do allow some weak ties to come in and friends. Right? If we all shut off <laughs> the weak ties from our, our, our liking networks, then it would probably be re almost reproducing. But the possibility is there right, that, that we could allow more heterogeneous and weaker ties to come into the net. So therefore, I think that uh, constructing social networks is fascinating. Thank you. Lee Kamido, also University State College of Dublin. Um, from an anthropological perspective, I think the socially embedded um, economic activity for things like um, pre-industrial societies, rural communities, ethnic enclaves, I think that's self-evident. Um, I'm wondering about the application of that to market societies where it seems that there's much more variation. I mean, I can think of a lot of situations where the economic relations could come first and then the actors do their best to create a social relationship out of that, knowing that the social relationships will then carry the moral imperatives that they want, but that the economic exchange precedes, the economic networks precede that. And then insofar as you have a good economic actor, they manage to cloak that in, in the social. Again, a, a very good point, and I don't 
I don't deny the argument. I don't know whether you've heard this argument in saying that, in fact, the economic activity uh, engage, allows sort of the uh, actors to engage on themselves and form these networks. And so in that sense, economic activity precedes uh, circulations. Yeah, in, 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 in fact, probably many cases uh, uh, like that. Uh, but uh, again, I'm simply saying, right, that we, especially uh, with the current development of different religious ethnic groups taking priority over economic activities and doing quite well. I mean, we used to say that uh, China is going, not going to last too long right, because it uh, violates all the rules of, uh, uh, quote, rational uh, 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 economic behaviors and so that. But uh, now I think uh, most of the theorists have second thoughts, including Fukuyama. <laughs> right? And uh, they, they suddenly realize that uh, perhaps it's, it cannot, they still think it will not replace the European, North American model uh, uh, of economic sociology. But on the other hand, uh, they, they understand it's not going to go away. And so what our argument here is to say, okay, let's pay some attention to that. And, uh, and, and this, yeah, I understand that economic activities promote relationships, but once we recognize the social relations promote economic relations or economic activities, then being an economic actor is say coming from general motors. How do you interact and get somehow integrated into that Guanxi network becomes paramount. Right? You cannot say deal with it as economic terms anymore. Right? You have to have banquets, gifts, <laughs> ceremonies, and so forth. Right? And beyond the you know the formal joint venture ties and so forth, in order for you to stay in there and make money. Other questions? Thanks, Josh. Uh, Philip O'Connell from the uh, Geary Institute for Public Policy, also at University College Dublin. Uh, so really enjoyed the, the lecture. Um, I'd like to ask you a question about your unit of analysis, because you articulated your entire approach in terms of the individual. And of course, most of us, for most of our lives, our social lives, we exist in institutions and in organizations. And in fact, you know, if you look at economic activity, it's mostly between organizations and, and there's been a huge increase in business to business type economic activity. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that the simple question would be, can you just simply replace individual with organization or is it more complex than that? Good question. And I probably don't know the exact answer. But I do hope that uh, this argument can be generalized beyond individual or inter actual relationships, right? And this is why I want to bring in the institutional networks into play. Right? So we do belong to groups. I mentioned certain sort of considered as primary primitive works like you know, kingship or family and, and religion and, 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 and ethnic and so forth. But of course, we also have other relationships in other groups. And it is possible, I would argue, that uh, to elevate the uh, level of analysis to groups or even societal level. And it becomes probably very important if we're not engaged in say non-Christian or uh, a, a societies. Right? So that uh, you're dealing with, uh, you want to break down, uh, bad term to use, but uh, the, the, the separation of these groups. Right? So, so you can, one way, of course, is to engage the actors. But are there other ways that we can promote the relationships between groups and so forth? It's a much harder task, I think. But it, it, I would think that uh, it's just as important and significant. I'm Alpha, sociologist. Sociolog OK. Uh, I want to know, uh, you have here um, uh, economical uh, link and you have a social. 
where can you put the political power mm. on that? Because mm. what's, uh, yeah, sorry, huh? I, uh, <coughs> I speak French, uh, yeah. Yes. yeah. So, uh, because what we are uh, observing today, we have very strong network. You have uh, Facebook, you have all that we never had before. Yes. We have, uh, uh, what you call, um, uh, that's the network, the social, uh, yeah. you have the economic. The economic, we have trillion, billion, and you know, all these budgets are very uh, big one. Yeah. But there are crises yes. in society. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think uh, the politics uh, should play a role here mm -hmm. to have a harmony and better yeah. uh, life for uh, Humanity. That's my question. Sorry, huh? my <laughs> you know, no, I'm no, learning. No. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> I understand the point. I appreciate the point. Uh, 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 I've always focused on social and economic activities. And uh, so, political scientists says, where's po politics? All right? Power. All right? And uh, I'm sort of two minded about this. On the one side, I say, well, okay, power in politics is based on social economic <clears throat> activities. This is my bias. Right? And uh, so that's one way to answer the question. But what's the other question? I see, I mean, I skipped too fast in the last uh, uh, slide, I do see some kind of regulatory all right, uh, elements eventually will have to come to play between the social economic activities. Uh, I think the reason why I have sort of emphasized that is de-emphasize politics, is that uh, politics, once you hold it supreme, it overwhelms everything. Uh, so I worry about China simply because the politics is so strong. Uh, so it sometimes overwhelms <coughs> the concerns about the social and economic activities. It would be, in a sense, it would be willing to sacrifice social and economic activities. And so I sort of try to shy away from that. All right? and, uh, but I think you're right. I mean, eventually, we need to bring the political aspect or the power aspect in this play. And so, uh, in my original writing on social capital, you, you probably should remember, the first thing I have to talk about is social hierarchy. Uh, you cannot get rid of that. Uh, but I took it as a, a, as a assumed basis for my analysis, rather than to analyze where's the origin of power, power and the development of power and so forth. And so I appreciate your point. I'm, I'm paralyzed. Um, is, is it on? Um, yes, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Miles Balf. I'm a lecturer in sociology at UCC. Um, I was basically wondering, um, if you're a researcher today and you're interested in social networks, should you be actively seeking to team up with kind of companies like Facebook and Google? Uh, absolutely. I think this is... Uh, well, I mean, there are sociologists, I know, who not only are... In, interest in Facebook, in fact, are hired as employees of Facebook. I hope they're good network people <laughs> because it's so important. It's critical. And also, even for a sociologist in general, we really need to pay more attention to what I call the cyber networks. Unfortunately, um, we sociologists so behind time. If you look at the curriculum, of, uh, not, I don't want to criticize other departments, my own department. I have only offer one course <coughs> in seven hours. So everybody else is talking about social relations, social ethnicity, inequality, income. So they, they still have not paid enough attention to seven hours, even though we engage in seven hours every week, every day. <coughs> hours at a time, faculty, students, and so forth. So we're so behind time, terrible. All right. 
so I really think that uh, we, we have a lot of catch up to do and it's important we catch up fast. Otherwise, again, the economies will turn themselves into a network analysis. <laughs> Actually, I think it's computer scientists that were doing They're doing it. It's fantastic. I mean, I was looking at, uh, because in sociology, probably the best known person who engaged in uh, the, the online research is Barry Wellman. Look at where, where he publishes stuff. Not in sociology. I guess in sociology, they are not interested in the journal. He publishes in computer science and uh, internet journals. Fortunate, very fortunate. Hi, I'm time from the Tuin from Rijks uh, University in Groningen. Um, I have a question about Facebook. Uh, what is uh, personally to you the one thing that Facebook can't do without? What's the one thing that makes it so successful, you know, other than AOL and MySpace? And uh, yeah. Okay, I, I think what it has sustained Facebook. I, I'm, I don't use Facebook. <laughs> so I'm totally neutral. Right? I'm independent. <laughs> but I follow it. I mean, I read it a lot about it. it it's, I think, that they've kept up their attention to how people network, how to improve it. You know? And uh, this is the right track. Right? That is, I think LL made a mistake. They took their eyes off the ball, that is, from the networks into making money. Uh, how to place the ads in certain places and so forth, so that the advertisers will get their money. Forgetting that they, they need to protect the membership, creating so the, and allow people to move from telephone oriented <laughs> connection to quickly uh, into cable and wire. They, they, they never did. And they're still today. I know that there are still AOL members who use phone connections. No wonder it's dying, right? So I think the, a, a Facebook probably has to say a long way to go before someone else uh, replaces it. The other, I think, a good feature is that it's your real people, real addresses, presumably. So the networks they create, you know, that is, is people can sort of verify each other's identity to a large extent, uh, not entirely, of course, I think they are. There are smart people <laughs> who can bypass that rule. But it's important. Uh, that is, uh, it's MySpace failed because they allowed anonymous. Well, then the people created you do, if you They are abusive. So the, the server dropped it. So I created another name. And endless. Uh, endless. And so you have to use your own names to do this. And I think that Facebook so far seems to be doing all right. Now, of course, I always say that there is no impact could exist forever, all right? But the next empire would better seven networks, all right? And you cannot do better uh, than cyber, uh, this Facebook as it stands, but you need to invent other kinds of network niches people are interested in. Right? So now I understand that there are some people who are beginning to move out of Facebook to other more specialized but network seven networks. And so there are, there are still ways, I think, uh, to, uh, to compete. But it's, it's getting harder and harder because just uh, the enormous size of network itself the cyber, uh, Facebook has created is just, just enormous. Uh, hi, Professor uh, Lanning. Uh, we talked about Guanxi many times in this lecture. I'm just wondering whether you think Guanxi is just a temporary phenomenon or it's a culture in China. Because, for example, I'm a Chinese, and in big cities like Shanghai, Shenzhen, or Guangzhou, uh, people would like to apply for jobs directly rather than find people because there are many opportunities there. But in rural areas, people who use Guanxi very much, at many times, because their next opportunity is there. So I think uh, as the economy develops in China, one should become next important. But still, in, in business studies, people, will, I mean, many researchers will do some research about Guanxi and how to do business in China and how to use Guanxi to build up relationship as you talk about uh, GM, how they, how they fit into the Guanxi content, something like that. So do you think Guanxi is a culture or just a temporary phenomenon because of the next developed economy in China? Thank you. It's a good question. And again, it's a... It's pretty much a followed along the line of Pauline's argument or Bertha's argument. Then, mainly, two relationships are 
either pre <coughs> or secondary uh, activities uh, in, a, in, in an industrial society. Uh, do I agree with it? I have not seen the evidence as yet. But you give a very good example. That is, uh, good educated students right, probably apply jobs uh, through the formal means. But I don't believe it. I'll tell you why I don't believe it. Because they not only directly apply, they also try to find relationships to promote their chances. Right? And we found this the kind of studies. If you simply ask people, how do you find a job? Of course I apply, I take the exam. Right? And then you say, has anybody helped? Yeah, yeah. You know, multiple ways. Uh, and uh, now, this phenomenon is just not Chinese only. Huanxi is a particular term used by the Chinese. But in many other cultures, in Russian, Japanese, Korean, Indian, there are also terms dealing with these deep relationships. It does not substitute or replace <coughs> formal mechanisms in certain market situations. But they certainly are added value. Right? So you have, you have the same qualifications. Next one, who do you think the employer would hire? Right? And the immediately see the difference. So I, first of all, I, you know, I, I think we have to be careful. Right? That is just, you know, if you just ask for one item, says, how do you get your job? Of course I took the exam, and I was the best, and, I, and so forth. But then you say, OK, <laughs> anybody help you? Boom, 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 this is what happened. And, uh, and it's, it's not only true in China. And it wasn't interesting against I, I started my career in studying in the United States. All my network research, earlier days, they're all based on data from the United States. And I find them all over the place. All right? But they're not finding jobs in the United States. Now, it is true that some jobs do not require much question. For example, if you are a good code programmer, then you've done good coursework. You say, okay, I know this, I know that, and so forth. I demonstrate my abilities, you will get a programming job. But for most other kinds of jobs, especially dealing with survey issues, personnel, administrators, managers, uh, you, you've got to have the social skills that look at and uh, they, so in the, you, usually in the interpersonal interviews, they will try to find out how skillful you are and what your kind of networks will be like. Right? Because social, social networks eventually become the social capital of the organization. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. All right? So those who really can swing in these networks are great for organizations. Um, hi, I'm Katie Sheehan. I'm a PhD student here in the sociology department in Trinity, and um, I really enjoyed your talk. I have a question about how it relates to some of your previous work. You, in the past, differentiated quite cleanly between the structure that's ideal for instrumental networks and the structure for expressive networks. I'm just curious, if they're always embedded in each other, does that change your ideas about structure at all? Uh, good question. Uh, I differentiate, again, that the networks of two types. One is what I call the institutionalized. So the institutional networks are based on some of the primary social identities, correct? Right? Your, your gender, your religion, your ethnicity, etc., etc. Right? So these are, I, I, I call them very structural, right? including, of course, the formal hierarchies. Right, in organizations. But there are other, this is why I think you know, sort of we should pay more attention. I also mentioned about actions and choices. We do make choices in our social ties. In fact, some social choices are difficult. Weaker ties, all right? More heterophilous ties. These are very difficult, extraordinary ties, but we do engage them uh, once in a while, not very often. And it's good for us, right? So granary is talk about weak ties. Uh, Lambert talk about structural holes. They all deal with the extension of this strong network. And so that, in that sense, right, 
it so happened that the cyber networks allow a clear picture how you engage, we engage in strangers, more or less. All right? uh, some of them, not many of them, but eventually. Right? Now, the interesting phenomenon, which I have not talked too much about, is tweet, Twitter. Right? Twitter is all the total strangers. Right? So, uh, so is that a network? Right? It's a one kind of network that builds on reputation. Right? Someone who is a celebrity, I mean, you, you just, just don't know, what, but they follow. They follow. Right? It's a very interesting phenomenon. It's a different kinds of networks built on weak ties. Right? I, I hope that someone will, will study that. Right? It's very interesting. Uh, Shane, we're locked up with this Thanks. Um, so, my question is slightly deviating back to your original theory around social capital. Um, and if you just have any general. Um, observations on how the, the last 10 years of cyber networks has maybe altered or informed that original theory um, in terms of the fertility of social capital in certain situations, whether it's, uh, for example, not maybe generalized social capital, but more goal-specific social capital, whether some become less salient because of cyber networks. Does that make sense? Uh, um, it, it, as a practical example... Let me tell you about how, what I think it yeah. extended the original theory. It extended the original theory not in terms of basic hypotheses or propositions, but rather the proportions or differentiation of types. So the, uh, you know, that is, uh, I, I talk about the strong key fact, weak type fact. And now suddenly this cyber networks allowed us to look at the weaker types. You know, how do you develop weaker types? Early on, we are very limited. We only say that uh, it happened by chance. Go to the bar, you become strangers, and eventually a few times you start talking and so forth. So it's a very casual kind of this. Whereas Facebook or CyberNowers allow us to see the deliberate, almost, actions taken by either the strangers or the ego, the center, uh, to bring them in. So that, in fact, it allows us to see the important thing is the weaker ties, yeah. the extension of that extent. And uh, so in a sense, it breaks down the density of the network. To me, it's very important. It's and very in important. terms of the fertility then of social capital per se, an individual uh, building new ties, so between access and mobilization. I think, that's it, 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 I think it enriches it. It absolutely enriches it. Because we know weak ties are beneficial. We know diversified ties are beneficial. It's a matter of how difficult to get it. But now we have an opportunity to study how you can fight. And one can, well, using an egocentric analysis, how one can expand one's social capital. Because we could have bring in different information, different resources, and so forth. So it's really a, 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 it's a very uh, exciting opportunity. I think. Any other questions? Okay, so on behalf of uh, University College Dublin and Trinity College Dublin, we'd like to thank uh, Professor Nan Lin for this fascinating lecture and thanks to all of you for asking him lots of challenging questions and having a very engaged discussion. So thanks very much for being here tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for being here and see you next time again. Thanks a lot. Good night. <laughs>